So I wanted to take a look at this fascinating little exchange between Steven Crowder and a feminist. And I know that debating feminism on the internet's very quickly getting to the level of debating atheism on the internet, you know, in that it's pretty 10 years ago. However, I do want to use this clip to try and make a larger point later on. So let's take a look. Sure, but you could all, there are also statistics that show that women are promoted less because employers are afraid that they're going to get pregnant and that they're not going to stick around for all that often. Um, they're not given raises at, mo at the same pace that men tend to be. Do women, like, get, do women get pregnant more often than men? Yeah, but that's not something that should be held against us because it cuts both ways. Women are, so, you know, told... I, I'm sorry, but I it's it's not something that should factor into whether or not I get a promotion about whether I may be pregnant down the line. So as the title of this video suggests, we want to use this as a uh, feminist to English translation exercise. And I think what's going on is when she says that shouldn't be held against us, translated into English, uh, what that means is I should not suffer any consequences as a result of that reality. Now the other problem is, when you want to mitigate the effects of reality, um, as reality is not a conscious being that you can bargain with, the only way you can mitigate the effects of reality is by having other people do it. And so when she says, I do not want to suffer the consequences of reality, the next logical step that she's implying is, other people need to shield me from the consequences of reality and in this case it means my potential boss needs to pay more for an employee than he would because I need to be shielded from the consequences of getting pregnant or you know in the larger sense it just means society needs to other people need to shield me from reality how much you money you will cost sick. or make the company should not be factored into how much money I pay you you can God forbid, get sick and have to take a long leave of absence from your company. Should that be factored in? But it is not a statistical 50-50 likelihood, sometimes more when you get over the age of 30, that I'm going to get sick. It is a statistical likelihood that most women, this is where feminists disconnect from, most women want to make babies. Most women want to have babies. And so women end up leaving the workforce for at least nine see, months. I would, I would argue against that. So you can see, obviously, as Steven Crowder did as he should and pointed out that there's a clear economic reality. It's not simple bigotry or prejudice or privilege as she'd like to reframe it. Going on, she starts shaking her head and her mouth starts gaping. Um, she's getting flustered because it has been pointed out to her that she's her opinions running counter to basic reality. And this culminates in that when Steven Crowder says most women want to have babies, which is such a non-controversial and blatantly obvious thing to say, all she can do is gape her mouth and shake her head side to side um, in an attempt to shake off basic reality. And that's really what this all comes down to. And this also ties into the larger point that I wanted to make. Very rarely, it seems, do people ever have a well thought out philosophy or logical sort of thought structure when they start talking about politics or just the way the things should be in the world. What is most likely the case, it seems for most people, is that they hear an idea or a, ph or a philosophy and it reacts with uh, their preconceived ideas and gives them a confirmation bias. People get a hit of dopamine, which is a feel-good hormone in their brain, when they have their ideological ideas reinforced. And so, in a very real neurochemical sense, we feel good having our ideas reflected in the world, and that gives us a confirmation bias and lets us make sense of the world according to our own sort of um, conceptual structures. So we want to survive and reproduce and gather resources for ourselves and control over our environment or control over the world allows us to do that. So lack of control or lack of understanding of the world I think runs counter to our biological imperatives and so um, I could imagine it's a source of anxiety. I mean, Jordan Peterson has said as much when he talks about the um, health risks and raised cortisol and anxiety of people at the bottom of the dominance hierarchy, people who don't know or are 
don't know how to fulfill their biological imperatives or are failing at doing so, um, this makes us feel very bad, whereas people up on the top feel very good. So I think that what happens here is that when you hear your preconceived ideas about the world reflected in the world, it's probably a confirmation bias that reinforces that we understand how the world works. Therefore, we have some ability to control it. Therefore, we have reduced anxiety because the path to our fulfilling our biological functions of resource gathering, re, uh, reproduction and survival is closer than if we can't control our environment. And I think in this clip what we're seeing is the inverse. This woman obviously has conceptualized her view of the world through the feminist lens and when confronted with reality such as basic market forces are going to reflect the value you bring to a company and if you're going to drop out of a job and get pregnant then you are going to bring less value to the company than a man who won't and will actually inversely have more incentive to work harder because he's probably going to have to be uh, supporting or bringing in extra money because his wife is pregnant. When she's confronted with this reality I think you can see on her facial expressions it's that cognitive dissonance and all she can think to say is well I would argue that. I mean of course but you can see that she's having having trouble with it because it's it's the little blue screen of death in her mental conceptions of the world. But the second and main point I really wanted to make about this is that, and this is a theme we're going to revisit a lot in this channel, the only game in town really is biology and our biological imperative is to gather resources, survive and reproduce our genes. That's, that's the meta game as Jordan Peterson would put it, that's the only game in town. And so all these things that are superficial ideologies, uh, feminism, religion, whatever political bent you're into, I think for the vast majority of people, um, they simply respond to incentives. I mean, people have been saying this for years, people respond to incentives, people respond to incentives. Um, and it's taken me a long time for that to really sink in, but what I think this means at a very core level is that, is that the ideologies that people adopt are just manifestations of their evolutionary strategies, their incentive structures to fulfill that base biological function of resources, survival and reproduction. Or in another way to put it, when you hear someone talking like this, you can also consider that it's highly likely that they're saying these things not because they believe them or that they would act on them. Their speech is a strategy, it's a tool they're saying things with the hope of controlling their environment and very often our environment is other people and their behavior so their speech is a tool it's not for conveying truth or thought it's simply a strategy to fulfill that base biological function it's like the, the fangs on a lion or the strength of of an ape it's it's a tool and if you really understand that it shouldn't come as any surprise that when confronted with the basic reality that this woman responds with um, deflection. Oh, I would argue that. I would argue that that can't be true. No, there's more to it, blah, blah, blah. Or outright, well, even if that is true, I should not have to suffer any consequences because of that. Her strategy was proving less effective than she'd hoped and so she's changing her strategy. She's employing different tools. She's attacking the same thing from different angles to try and achieve her goal. She's not interested in the truth. Um, on a side note, I actually think this woman is probably better than most and I think that she actually has the ability during this conversation to stop and acknowledge a counter truth. So I think her as a person is probably one of the better ones and it wouldn't surprise me that in five or ten years she's actually an anti-feminist. But this exchange was a great example to show the idea that speech is simply a tool or a strategy and that the underlying game underpinning all of this is base individual biological resource survival and reproduction. Of course it's still quite possible that you could be having a legitimate conversation with someone who can actually think um, but if I had to put a number on it I would say well firstly I'd say that those people are very rare I would say it's going to be under 10% of the people that you ever come across in your life 
who actually are interested or will change their mind based on reason and evidence. I mean, I think I've heard that number thrown out there before that 10% of people is basically what you're looking at if you're looking for people who will change their mind based on new information. The other 90% won't, maybe it's due to confirmation bias, but once again, maybe it's just a base strategy. They're not talking because they're trying to convey truth, they're talking to achieve a result. But now to make a final point, the good news is I think that if you really understand this on a deep level, you also have a pathway to freedom from this. Uh, from these verbal strategies and ideological games and strategies and maneuvering. And the freedom is that if you can't judge this person to be presenting you with a genuine moral case or a genuine line of inquiry or thought, then you don't really need to worry about it because all that's happening is me, 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 me. Did you know about me? Maybe you should give something to me. Oh, well, that's going to negatively affect me, so I don't like it me 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 <laughs> and I mean if people said it like that you wouldn't even give them a second thought you'd be like well I'm sorry but what sort of world would we be in if everyone was as self-centered as you but that's basically you know once again this is a translation exercise most of this stuff comes down to me 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 did you know about me have I told you about me lately give me stuff I want stuff and so the freedom is understanding that and the freedom is not letting it bug you more than it has to I mean I'm still working on ways to maneuver these conversations in the moment I mean that's very hard because you can spend you know a bit of time trying to work out if you're actually having a genuine conversation with someone who can actually think but when you're the sort of person who thinks very deeply and seriously about the world um, a lot of the emotional triggering really comes from considering these ideas very seriously and once again the freedom I think we can all achieve is to stop taking these ideas seriously when we can't judge them to be genuine in the first place so with that in mind let's jump out of stark reality and back into feminist loopy land and we'll go back to the start of the clip and we'll look at what she's talking about in terms of privilege Privilege as defined by that is a special right, advantage, or immunity granted or available to only a particular group or person. Right. If you talk about privilege in sociology, that examines the social, economic, and political advantages, advantages excuse me, given to a group on the basis of sex, race, finances. So once again, we can do our translation on her little speech about privilege and in fact the whole concept of privilege. She's saying rights and advantages granted to certain groups. Um, now this is a reframing and because what she's not considering here is that it's not something that these are not advantages granted to certain groups. These are advantages or rewards earned by certain groups and maybe they are earned by certain groups at higher numbers than others. And so once again, if we translate from feminist into incentives, it's a strategic reframing in order to circumvent the competition that they lose within. And why do so many people uh, adopt these ideologies? Because they're incentivized to, because it benefits them. If you can't do well enough within direct head-on competition, then subvert the competition, because at the end of the day, it's not honesty or truth or legitimate hierarchy or legitimate authority that drives a lot of these people it's simply which strategy will get me what I want and will get me resources and will get me status and will get me survival and reproduction and when that really sinks in when you really understand that you can be free